Welcome to this episode of the Houndsman XP Podcast, the Friday edition, because I'm going to do an Ask Me Anything Friday. I get tons of questions about all kinds of topics through messengers and email and different stuff, and I can't answer them all on a podcast, but I just try to pick some of the most interesting ones. And this one I'm going to fly solo on. I'm just going to take some questions. We're going to answer them to the best of my ability. You're going to get some of my opinions on some of these things. So it's not gospel. It's just my opinion. And you have the freedom to take it or leave it. So let's get down to it in this AMA Friday. This is a box shaker. It's time to dump the box. This is the Houndsman XP Podcast. Good dog, get that bear. Get that bear in here. The original podcast for the complete houndsman. The podcast that represents our lifestyle of extreme performance. Get up there! Yeah! 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 Good boy! Good boy, Ranger! Uniting houndsmen across the globe from east to west, north to south. You know, if you're going to catch a cat or a lion, you know, you have to have teamwork. We take you to the wildest places on earth. Yeah, so how many day how many days a week can you spend that? As much as I can to be honest with you. Any time that I get, I'm I'm out there. Join us for every heart pounding adventure on Houndsman XP. I'll tell you like I tell everyone else, I'm gonna hunt whether you're here or not, so you might as well be here. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I love getting feedback from all of you that are listening to this podcast. I don't know why you contact me. I mean, we've got some experts on this Houndsman XP team that can answer a lot of your training questions and stuff like that. And I try to defer to them. I mean, we got Heath Hyatt is a professional canine trainer. He's been a houndsman for 30 years. He's got some of the nicest bear catching pack of dogs that I've I've ever seen. So I hope you guys are reaching out to Heath. We got Chad Reynolds. I mean that guy can train an alligator to sit. So I mean when when you start comparing my credentials in training and understanding of, of animal behavior, especially dog behavior, some of the things that I see Chad doing with his dogs are unbelievable. Some of the reels that you see, uh him those are all trained behaviors that he's he's getting from his dog there's a lot of natural stuff there too and i'm not trying to expose chad i'm just trying to uh highlight the fact that he's an outstanding trainer and if you haven't done so yet man they're he and seth are producing a show called hxp tv and that thing is dropping on our youtube channel so when you go to youtube you look at um just just search for Houndsman XP, and you're going to see all of the our past episodes have been loaded there. We're dropping gear reviews. That's a hint to you, Shane. Get some of those gear reviews up, man. We're ready to start seeing those. Shane is my IT guy for Houndsman XP. He's doing an outstanding job, and and there's a lot of stuff for us to talk about, and we're going to cover a lot of different things. But let's get into some of this questions some of the some of the inquiries i get i'm just going to do a few here and some of them i get asked multiple times so i'm not going to identify any particular uh message or messenger i get these messages through facebook messaging i get instagram we field a lot of email messages and um 
that email address, if you want to reach out to us and contact us about anything, the best place to do that, because it's monitored by, by me and it's monitored by Shane, is info.houndsmanxp at gmail.com. If you drop a message right there, if you drop us an email there, just a general inquiry about anything Houndsman XP, it will get seen and read and responded to. With my schedule, me running around, hunting and going to shows and and just carrying the message for houndsman xp and houndsman houndsman that's who i'm carrying the message for houndsman everywhere then sometimes things get lost in the sauce i'm going to kick off the messages the questions for this ama from a houndsman from kansas and um, i don't know adam murray personally i've never met him but he's always been a very good supporter of of this show, Houndsman XP in general. Uh, I know that um, my buddy L.W. Nixon at Cajun Lights is working with him on youth programs and different things that Adam's got going on out there. You know, he's he's a humble guy that, that just loves to hunt. And um, I really appreciate you, Adam. So I want to kick off this AMA Friday with your most recent inquiry. So Adam dropped me a message, which he does often, and um, he said that he got talked into taking a well-bred blue tick pup on board and kind of had the urge to to train a, a blue tick. Up until now, Adam has had mountain curs and dream walker coon hounds that he's trained, he's had success with them. He's put titles on the the walkers and why he would want to dive into blue ticks. He said because they kind of look cool. They, he thinks he thinks they're beautiful dogs, which I agree with him. Let me just read the the message he sent me and um, go through it. So this is what Adam Murray wrote to me. So using your podcast and stuff I picked up from working with canine handlers, I've started five pups in the last two years, one OMCBA and four walkers. The OMCBA had to be put down due to kidney defects. The walkers all made nice hounds. Three made night champ before two, and the one I kept has wins but not pushed as hard. That being said, a blue tick breeder has convinced me to take one of his pups and try my hand with them. Do you have any thoughts about this particular strain of hounds? I'm not going to say the strain of hounds. And do you have any specific suggestion for starting the blue dog? Now I'm just going to read my reply and we'll break it down a little bit. So this is what I wrote back to him. I said, treat her like a hound, but remember she is not a walker. Look for subtle indications of natural ability. I may not It may not come together as early, but will finish out well. In my opinion, today's pressures from Facebook coon hunters and trainers result in all pups being pushed too hard and too early. They get overworked, and their minds and bodies cannot handle the stress. Most pups' joints and muscular development is not mature for anything above very mild hunting. When hunted too hard, too early, the joint pain causes a mental block to perform. For example, we don't ride horses until their joints close. And that's about two years old for a horse, two and a half. And with pups, that is, and with a pup that is hunted too early, they are in pain while we're trying to train them. All right, so there's a lot going on there with Adam's question and then my answer so you heard the question let me break down my answer for you a little bit i want to start off by saying this walker breeders have really focused on performance performance based breeding particularly 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 that's a big word for an old hillbilly that's for sure but they have really focused on performance-based breeding that can win in competition night hunt events. They're successful. 
There's no doubt about it. I mean, that's why you see so many handlers hunting walkers. That's why you see so many walkers in winter pictures and things like that. And most people hunting a walker, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the ability to take that hound to a night hunt and dominate in the in the competition coon hunting space. And the uh, Walker coon hound is very well suited for that because so many people are moving to that end. And guys that hunt walkers, guys that breed walkers, they're willing to overlook all kinds of personal differences in order to be successful, in order to win. You can get in a fist fight with a guy in the parking lot, but if you've got a nice walker hound and I've got a nice walker female, then walker breeders and walker guys are more than happy to overlook that because really at the end of the day, all they want to do is be successful and they want to win. With that being said, it's not that other breeds and breeders of other breeds of hounds don't want to win and they don't want to be successful, but all of us hunting those off-colored dogs, as walker breeders like to call them, sometimes we let personal feelings get in the way of that, of being successful. Since this question was out the, about a blue tick, you know, and I have blue ticks, I am not a blue tick breed expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm, I just like to hunt a good dog, and I've had decent success with blue ticks in the past 15 years or so. But a lot of times, blue tick guys, they get hung up on bloodlines and maintaining their own bloodline. And this isn't a dig on anybody, but I think Dave Dean started that. We're up to like hammer 30 or something now. And we wanna show that that dog has been line bred back on the old blood. We're trying to preserve our kennel names and and things like that whereas a walker guy they'll take a wipeout dog and go breed it to a pine bluff dog hoping to get the best performance it also gives them more diversity and genetics and things like that and i'm not a geneticist either so i'm not even sure why i'm doing this podcast i'm not an expert on anything it's just my opinion and my observations i guess from from being in this thing for 40 years so let's get back to the root of the question. Is there anything he needs to do different with this blue tick than, than what he would with a walker? Well, the first thing that I think people need to realize, and I see this a lot, it's like, hey, I've trained this. I want to try a plot. I've, I've trained walkers for a long time. I'd like to try a blue tick. And I think we all need to go into that expectation that every one of these breeds has been uh, bred – by different men with different goals and and each breed is a little bit different you know i competed in pkc with two different mountain curs and i wouldn't expect them to act like walker dogs but they won i made two pkc champions out of omcba mountain curs they were registered as crossbreds but it's the ability to take the individual dog and see know the know the breed traits okay you got to be familiar with the breed traits but if you're going to take this other breed and expect it to be like a walker then you're already you're already fighting this battle from a losing position when i start a pup they're just running loose here on my place they're all running around and i'm watching those pups all the time i'm studying them i'm looking for behaviors that are going to transfer to the skill set and the talents that will be needed later in life. I want inquisitive pups. I want bold pups. I want pups that are, are you know, using their nose. Uh, just those glimpses of greatness. I want, I want pups that naturally are, um, you know, drawn to me. If a pup's naturally shy, uh, you can overcome some of that by feeding out of your hand. But a lot of times they're going to be harder for you to work with. You know, that's not a, a beginner type dog. We've talked about scatter feeding where you take a handful of dog food and you throw it out in the yard. Uh, you can even do it in a gravel driveway 
and and watch the behaviors of those pups as they run up there you know when they run past it or they're doing a scent hook and let me let me explain how i set that up so when the pups are out then i will scatter feed out in the grass where they won't see me and then i'll just go about doing my work and eventually they'll see me and they'll come running over and when they start moving towards me that's when i start watching I start watching those pups' behavior as they're running through that area where I scattered feed. And I position myself strategically there where I can see those pups. Uh, You know, I place the feed between me and where they're at, so they're running through it. I'm looking for their body language, their reactions. You know, do they throw that head up or boom, do they do a scent hook and start looking for feed in the grass and, and, the ones that come through there first, a lot of times, are the ones that are actually showing the other pups where it's at. So I like a pup that, that you know, I can do more with a pup that, that is bonded to me or wants to be with me. So what am I digesting from all that? What am I, what am I really learning from that when I see pup behavior and, and how they react? You know, the pup that... that doesn't want to look then then i need to work and evaluate that pup's hunt drive you know does it have the hunt drive to go do the job that i want to see if the pup comes through and you know he gobbles up a few morsels of of dog food and then and then he comes running to me or he he gets distracted and go chases a bird or or whatever then you've got to look at you know, attention span and that, that pup's dedication. Now you can go too far. You know, the old blue tick, we've all heard of blue tick. And is he over there trying to grub out the very last morsel? Well, some people need that sort of dog when you get into, to the Southwest climates, but for a coon hound in Indiana, um, it may not be the most desired dog that you're looking for. And that's just one example of, of that sort of stuff. But let's boil, boil it down to the blue tick versus a walker. When I said, just remember, this blue tick pup is not a walker. The blue tick is, from my experience, a completely different type of a, of a young dog. They develop differently. Some people say it's slower. I don't know that that's true. I think, I just think it's different. And I use this analogy a lot when I'm, when I'm starting pups, you know, we all like the early starter. I think it's important that we have dogs or puppies or we're breeding dogs that, that have the natural instincts to do the job that we're ultimately going to want them to do. But if it comes down to an early starter or a solid finisher, I want the solid finisher. A person with dog sense and a keen eye will see the traits in a puppy at a very young age that will turn into a really solid skill set later on in life. When we overlook all those subtle nuances and we're just looking for turn pup loose, pup trees game, we'd really be better off just going out and buying a young started dog from people that understand dog behavior. Find find Heath Hyatt or Chad Reynolds, uh, some of these other great trainers out there that, that have a knack for starting young dogs and just purchase a young dog from them. That, I think that's the main reason why we still see people, the Facebook crowd saying stuff like, eight out of 10 don't make it. <laughs> Man, if that's the truth, if, if we're producing an 80% failure rate, it's not a training issue, or or we really need to look at our selection for breeding pairs. We've been doing this long enough now that that breeders, if I was was a full-time breeder and I saw somebody come out and say eight out of 10 doesn't make it, I'd just be up in arms. I'd just be like, are you kidding me? You know, that it's, it's, that's a selection and a genetic problem. I think we're way too far down that road to, to settle for that, but it seems like there are still people out there that, that are willing to do that. All right. So I just want to spend a few, 
few minutes here, just a couple minutes, really. We need to be moving along. But on the other statements in my answer to Adam on this thing about pushing pups too early. Back when I first started talking to Heath Hyatt, one of the first podcasts he was ever on with me, uh, before he was even producing podcasts of his own, Heath made a statement in that podcast that when you send a dog in too young, you know, a year old, that's like sending a a, a six-year-old into the boxing ring with Mike Tyson. And that's sound wisdom. You know, we put these pups out there and we put them in situations and then we make it a bad experience for them. That carries over. I mean, they don't they don't forget that. And then you're trying to undo negative experiences in hopes of producing positive results. So when we expose pups too young to hunting, we run that risk. They could have bad experiences and really set your training back. And that may be, may be causing some of that slower development that you're seeing in your pup. You Maybe you don't even realize they had a bad experience out there when they're not standing at your feet. So that's just part of looking at the pup overall. So that's just the mental side of it. They also structured training. I really like what Chad Reynolds has to say. You know, five minutes of training a day is good training. It's not overworking, overstimulating pups, young dogs. It's just doing good structured training in small doses can can do a lot for your pup. It doesn't have to be a two-hour excursion. It just needs to be consistent and routine in their lives. Your conditioning behavior. You want to see a response to a certain situation. The only way to get that is through repetition and routine and consistency in your training. In other words, it can't be okay today and then not be okay tomorrow. You know, it, it if you're going to tell your dog three times to do something or train them and you're just nagging them, they're going to learn that the third time you say it, that's when you really mean it. You know, just routine, consistency, and and keep it short and simple. So let's talk about physical maturity, what they can actually handle. You know, obviously we're not going to keep them – pinned up and and not let them run around we're not going to be a helicopter dog dad or dog mom here puppies are going to play they're going to run they're going to do all this sort of stuff but we've all seen when these pups who are genetically hardwired to pursue game and give it their all they hit another gear it's not like um you know running around the yard or or wrestling with their with their um litter mates or anything like that we've all seen it if if you spend any time in the woods at all or with young dogs we call it when the light switch goes off you know when the light bulb comes on we see that differences in attitude and some pups that starts at six or seven months old well most experts will agree that a dog most dogs our hound breeds in particular uh, are physically mature not any earlier than one year old and then larger breeds it can be as late as two years old so somewhere between my terrier size and tough and a saint bernard in my mind is where my hounds mature where where they're physically mature their their joints are developed their skeletal system is developed their joints are are well developed and and that's going to occur somewhere between one and two years old <clears throat> so when we push pups we've seen it like i said we we take them hunting and man we can't wait to get back to the house and and get on facebook and brag about our dog our pup our young dog we saw the light light bulb boom the light bulb moment and all of a sudden it's like man that's what I've been looking for. What's the natural tendency? Let's do it again tomorrow night. And we continue down that road. The pup 
the pup just isn't physically mature. His brain says go, his genetics say go, but his body is not ready for that kind of stress. And they will literally, we've all seen this too. If you've spent any time, a dog instincts, one with hunt drive, prey drive, they have a hard time turning that off, even to the point where they will risk personal injury. They, they don't reason that part out. So my caution, and I think part of the reason that we get so many of these young dogs and we say eight out of ten don't make it, we've, we're on the wrong schedule. I've been guilty of this. My jazz female, <clears throat> she treated her first coon at five months old. It was five months and a couple days. I mean, right at five months old. Uh, guess what I did? I started setting goals. I started setting goals for, for jazz. And when I saw her do it the second night, probably the next night, then it was like, oh, I've got something here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tree 100 raccoons with this dog before she's a year old. And so I started pushing. I pushed and I pushed and I pushed. And she accomplished what my schedule said she should have done. Well, here's the other side of it. I remember the night I was hunting. I was hunting with a friend of mine out here, and he was he was just impressed with my young dog. He, he still talks about her. And... Ken and I were, were hunting. We turned the dogs loose. Jazz went 20 yards and stopped and turned around and looked at me. Well, now it's like, what's going on here? So I tried to shoe her on and get her to go on and couldn't do it. I'd hook her back up and try to recast, you know, starting that from recast. When the snap snaps, man, I want, I want dirt kicked in my face and gone. She wouldn't go. So the, the temptation was to be upset or to be embarrassed, which I was a little bit. I'm not going to lie. You know, I've, I'm, I was putting my ego on this young dog to carry, just like the old saying, a man's ego is a heavy burden for your dog to carry. Yeah, I was doing that for a couple minutes. And then it was like, hey, dummy, you're doing exactly what you know <laughs> And what you've told other people that you shouldn't be doing with a young dog. You're putting way too much pressure on them. You're trying to accomplish. I was trying to accomplish my goals instead of looking at the potential in a young dog. And I was pushing too hard. A few weeks ago, uh, around the end of November or so, Heath produced a podcast called Baron Hounds Outfitter. And that was with Kirk Rogers. And they, they talked about the physical strains that you put on these dogs. And I think that directly transfers into a dog's mentality. If your back hurts or your knees hurt every time you play softball, then it's not going to be long before you're not going to want to play softball. You may love it, but you're still not going to do it. And I think the same can be said without being too anthropomorphic about it. But, I mean, think about it. We're expecting a conditioned response to hunting. We want to see positive behavior and a, and a re positive response to following a track, to going hunting. If the dog's in pain, that can be one of the reasons. We hear so many guys talk about blowing young dogs up. We can blow them up. That was a podcast that Josh did. I think it is absolutely transferable here. So I guess to wrap this one up, Adam, is, uh, you know, thank goodness you didn't choose plots. And um, you got a good shot with the blue tick. And that's not to say that, that you couldn't have done the same thing with a black and tan or, a, or an English dog. You just got a blue tick. Just take your time, look for the real values and the real qualities, the investigative behavior, uh, the, the willingness to use its nose, all those little simple things. You got this, man. 
There's no big deal about training a blue tick versus training a walker versus training any other kind of dog, except for plots and yogs. You got to be, you got to have some brain damage going on there to even, even start down that road. So, so Adam, man, thanks for reaching out and uh, giving me a great topic to talk about. The Houndsman XP podcast is fueled by Joy Dog Food. Joy Dog Food has a rich tradition of supporting the Houndsmen of America. Founded in 1945, Joy is proud of its history and the relationship it has built with the American Houndsmen. And in 76 years, there's never been a recall. Made with 100% American-made high-quality ingredients, Joy Dog Food has one of the highest calorie-dense formulas on the market. For 76 years, this Made in America product has kept hunting dogs in the field day after day, season after season. And when we say Made in America, Joy has a long track record of fighting for American freedoms by being on the front lines against the animal rights movement and their extremist tactics. Joy will fuel your hounds and fight for your freedoms, fueled by Joy. on this AMA. All right, moving on. We've got to talk about this. I get, this is one of the hottest questions going on. My, my inboxes are blowing up because people want to know about this network move. Houndsman XP has been one show. It's been one show. It's incorporated all the shows that you listen to with Heath and with Chad and Shane, uh, Chad and Seth, um, with Bryce in the past, with Josh in the past, that's all ran on the Hounds, one name, Houndsman XP. So there's, we are moving to our own network and we've, we've published all that under a, a podcast network called Sportsman's Empire. Sportsman's Empire has done a great job for us. We've, we've made a lot of good friends there and we wish them all the success in the world, but we need to talk about why um, why we're making the move with the Colorado deal going on and all the work that we're trying to do on the f- conservation front, then when we're running a, a podcast on another network, it gets into our bottom line. And I hate to say that it's about money, but it's about money. Everything's about money. When I'm leaving money on the table, that could be going to support houndsmen, houndsmen causes, things like that, then I've got to look at making changes here. Since the first of the year, I've traveled to Denver and I've traveled to Nashville, two big trips in a month. And those were those trips were taken to represent houndsmen and talk to people who may not be familiar with houndsman i went to the international sports expo sportsman's expo in denver colorado and there was one there were three people there three uh i was going to say one booth but we were all three in the same booth three houndsmen there in that whole place and we talked to hundreds of people about initiative 91 why it's important uh how hounds are so valuable in the wildlife management picture and why we need to preserve protect and promote this lifestyle we all love so much so shorty gorm and cody lostro and i were in the coloradans for responsible wildlife management booth and we had had multiple opportunities to talk to people that weren't houndsmen but they're going to support us and that kind of stuff and if you want to send gift cards for airlines or whatever or if you know where I can get those free tickets, you know, drop me an email on that email I sent you, or I told you about earlier. But that stuff all takes money to do that. And that's what we're dedicated to at Houndsman XP. The whole show was always set up for that purpose. I spent my whole career in trying to preserve, protect, and promote hunters' freedoms to hunt, and all that sort of stuff. Who's your tree dog alliance? Jerry Mall and I started that together to represent houndsmen. That was back in the early 2000s. And Houndsman XP was developed for that reason too. We like to have fun. We want you to be entertained, but don't, don't ever mistake the real mission 
of Houndsman XP is to maintain a sustainable future for Houndsman so that we can go out there and we can do our thing. So when is all this going to happen? Well, it's happening right now and you don't even know it. There is going to be something that you're going to need to do. And I'm asking you to take a few minutes during this podcast, push the pause button and go do this right now, if you would, please. Go into wherever you're looking for podcast and search for Extreme Performance Network. Houndsman XP stands for Houndsman Extreme Performance. The new network is called Extreme Performance Network. When you do that search, you're going to see all of the individual shows. You're going to see Houndsman XP. You're going to see The Journey. You're going to see All Mixed Up. You're going to see The Dogmen. Those are all going to be listed under the Extreme Performance Outdoor Network. And just push subscribe. You can also go in to those same platforms and search for The Journey, All Mixed Up, The Dogmen, Houndsman XP. Those, those shows are all standalone shows now. Before, if you were looking for The Journey or you're looking for The Dogmen, you had to search Houndsman XP and it fell under our label. Now these are all going to be standalone shows that you can just tune into. I mean, if you're, if you're a hog hunter and you don't want to listen to anything else except Ed Barnes and Tenor Hare one, uh, once a, a month, that's great. You can do that. So that's just an example. It's imperative that you do that because starting March 1st, if you're listening to this on the Sportsman's Empire Network, after March 1st, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. I know we all hate changes, but I'm telling you that this is as easy as a Google search. When you open up Apple Podcasts, there's a little search magnifying glass there. You push that and type in Houndsman XP and make sure it says Extreme Performance Outdoor Network right by the title of the show. The Journey, Extreme Performance Outdoor Network. After March 1st, the other feed is going away. It's not going to exist anymore. So that's how you can stay up to date on the network. And if you start now, you won't even have to worry about when it, when it quits playing over on the other feed. It's going to have its own feed. The other thing you can do is when you see our social media posts on Houndsman XP podcast group or Houndsman XP, anywhere you see the, the podcast being showcased there, just hit that link and it'll take you into our link tree, an easy link that way to make sure that you're not disrupting the flow of, of Houndsman XP and, and listening here. I know it's an extra step for you, but I think in the long run, you'll see that this is going to open up a lot more doors for Houndsman and representing you as, as a Houndsman and a hunter, making sure that these other organizations recognize us and give us the respect that we deserve you know so that's that's what it's all about folks getting the message out building the narrative telling our story who we are and what we do why we do it that's what houndsman xp is all about so that's why we created a new network if you have any questions about that make sure that you're checking out you can find the uh, links on houndsmanxp.com that's our website but the new network name is going to be called, it is called, it's already formed, it's already up, Extreme Performance Outdoors. And we're going to add to that. It's not, we've already got a falconry podcast there. There was a really cool episode that Jonathan Munyer uh, dropped last week with a guy by the name of Gary Brewer. That guy was fascinating to listen to. He's, he's written several books about falconry. I'm not a falconer, never even been... I've seen some birds flown, but I was drawn in and I was intrigued by this this um, falconry guy that that Jonathan had on had on his podcast, Falconry Chronicles. All right, let's move on. You know what app I use on my phone more than any other app besides the podcast app to listen to this here podcast? I use Onyx. Onyx Maps is the most comprehensive mapping system for hunters on the market today. I use it all the time. When I was in New Mexico, 
I was looking at 40,000 acres of ranch that I needed to learn. I flip open Onyx and just start studying, studying the map. When I'm riding trails, I put the tracking app on. It helps me get around in strange country. I could mark water sources, food sources, bear sign, just all kinds of options within Onyx. You need to check out Onyx Maps by going to houndsmanxp.com. Click on the link on our sponsor page. You'll go right to Onyx Maps, and when you check out, enter the code HXP20, and you will get 20% off of your order. Know where you stand with Onyx. The Houndsman XP podcast only endorses products that we would use ourselves. And I do use Elite Nutrition supplements. Elite Nutrition offers supplements for your horses, your mules, your dogs, and even you. These all-natural products work with your dog's natural immune system and its normal natural body function, not to treat symptoms, but to fix problems. Stop pumping pharmaceutical toxins into yourself or your dogs and start using these all-natural products that work with the perfect system that God gave you. Go to tryelitenutrition.com and check out their products for wound care, prebiotic, probiotic, puppy stuff. It's all there. Parasite control. If you expect extreme performance, you need Elite Nutrition. Yeah, so Jacob Zachary sent me a message. I don't know if you guys know Jacob or not, but um, man, he's got some nice dogs. He's he's one of those upper end trainers. He he understands dog behavior and and everybody I've ever talked to that's hunted with him or his dogs um, just talk about the quality of the dogs that that he he raises and trains. So, but Jacob sent me a question about supplements. He's got an older dog now that he's dealing with some arthritis issues and wanted to to know about supplements well let me tell you that i'm like the world's biggest skeptic and always thought that a lot of these supplements were snake oil more or less you know buy the product and it's a miracle drug or that it was some kind of marketing scheme to get some fur mommy's money for her little fur baby type deal and so I was real skeptical about it, but Heath found a product when he went to a canine seminar called 1TDC, 1, capital T, capital D, capital C. Just that easy to find it. This is an oral health mobility supplement. And when we started talking to Olivier about doing a sponsorship with him, we told him straight up, it's like, we want to try the product. We want to use it, see if we get results from it, and then we'll talk about and discuss any kind of a sponsorship deal. So it wasn't just about us finding somebody that was willing to throw money at us to, to you know, pay for this podcast. We're not into promoting snake oil and junk. So Heath and I both started using the one TDC pro product and saw almost immediate results. Heath's talked about it several times on the journey. I've talked about it on the Houndsman XP podcast, but the one TDC product really is for joint mobility. Heath and I both pound, pound these hounds on, on bear and there's nothing that, that takes it out of a dog more than, than a hard running bear. I've done it out in New Mexico, and I have seen this kind of result. So traditionally, you know, you take a hound and you haul them across the country to a place like New Mexico, and the terrain's different. It just, that country just grinds a dog up. And I would hunt two, maybe three days, and then dogs would be laid up for several days. That stress on the dog's body has been greatly reduced. I'm not seeing that as much now. I'm seeing dogs that are recovering faster. They're not aching. Their joints aren't hurting. Heath was seeing swelling in some of his dog's joints, and he started using the 1TDC product, and he's pretty much eliminated 
all of that issue. He's he's running dogs multiple days in a row using one TDC. The other supplement that I had to try because Chip Chip Kozier was telling me it was good good for my dog, and I wanted to wanted to uh, verify anything that Chip Kozier says. No, seriously, uh, is the Elite Nutrition products, and it's just one product really that that has been a game changer and that's the essential dog so one scoop of this essential dog it's a dry product it's powder one scoop will treat 10 pounds of feed so when i break that down it costs me about five cents per day to give essential dog and there's all kinds of stuff in this i'm looking at the label right now there's b12 uh, magnesium oxide, manganese. Uh, I'm trying to find some of the um, ones that really. There's protein in it. Um, biotin. There's all kinds of stuff there that that are good for your dog. You know, just natural natural products. There's also diatomaceous earth, which is a um, a worm or a natural parasite control. There's diatomaceous earth in essential dog. And like I said, it costs you about five cents a day per dog. And this is, I'm telling you, man, I, I was that guy that I'd get somewhere and take this big trip and go hunting and run. You get on one good bear race the first day, and then you're riding around for three days, hanging around camp or, or riding around on the truck, and you really want to be hunting. Using the one TDC and essential dog has been a game changer on that aspect. Now I'm sitting in the truck watching my Garmin, wondering when the dogs are ever going to get worn down so I can take a day off. So the one TDC is a topical or it's an oral. Uh, the recommended usage is on the one TDC. It's a gel cap. So you can twist the top of the gel cap off, put it on your finger and rub it on the dog's gums. Olivier did a whole podcast with us about oral absorption and how you how you get more absorption that way. It also takes care of that dental. He's he's really big and speaks well on on dental hygiene and the long term effects for that. But you can use it that way. You can just give it to him as a treat in the evening, uh, or you can use it topically. You can actually squeeze it out and in, in your finger on your finger and and massage it into joints and places like that. Essential dog powder comes with a scoop in the in the can here and the and then you just treat one scoop per 10 pounds of feet it's that easy and it costs you about a, a, around a dollar cost you around a dollar to to get that good result like i said man i'm i'm super skeptical about this stuff i'm the type of guy that when i see diet stuff i don't believe you can take pills and and solve all your problems if you're a fat ass to get off your butt and get to work but with essential dog even with the best canine nutrition the best dog food this stuff has has been a game changer for us so jacob i would recommend looking at essential dog and the one tdc products the one tdc they've been a sponsor in the past and you can go to a website called and it's just one tdc houndsman.com and it'll take you right to the site, and you can start um, start enjoying the results from that. Highly recommend both those products. And no, it's not because they're paying me to say it. I spent my own money on these products, verified they worked, before we ever even discussed a sponsorship from them. If I wouldn't use it, I'm not going to peddle somebody's junk off on you guys. Essential Dog from Elite Nutrition and 1TDC. Check them out. The Houndsman XP Podcast Network is powered by Cajun Lights. All of your lighting needs for hunting can be taken care of at Cajun Lights. They have three models of cap lights. I'm going to run through them real quick. You've got the Rogaroo, which is their high-end light. If you're a competition hunter and you got to find that coon up in a tree and it's all riding on finding that coon, you'll want the Rogaroo on your head. Next is the Bayou. That's a pretty standard light, but it's got packed with features 
It's got multiple colors. It's got walking lights. It's got the red, the green, the amber. It's all built in right into that light. And then you have one of my personal favorites, the Micro Gator. The Micro Gator is an ultra lightweight cap light. It's got all the features of a white light, red, green, and amber. I've used this light for everything from finding bear tracks early in the morning to coon hunting at night to working on plumbing in the house, changing tires on the side of the road. My truck doesn't leave the driveway without a Cajun light in it. And that light is the Micro Gator. Every Cajun light is durable, made from the highest quality components, and it is backed by Cajun's top rated customer service. Check out Cajun Lights. You can go to our website at houndsmanxp.com. Go to our sponsors page, hit that link, it'll take you right to Cajun Lights. Check them out. They got a lot of stuff to offer over at Cajun Lights. All right, last question, and we'll wrap up this AMA Friday. And uh, I get a lot of inquiries or questions or whatever about, you know, the 357 versus the 10 millimeter. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about handguns. And, and these come from a lot of different directions. I've talked about, I carry a Kimber K6 with me most of the time, unless I'm going to be in like grizzly country and then I'll carry a 44. A lot of time the questions are asking me to compare a 357 to a 10 millimeter and the effectiveness of the round and and all of that sort of stuff. Well, I've never had a 10 millimeter, so I can only talk from a very general standpoint on that part of it as far as the calibers go. But I've done the research and 357 and 10 millimeter, there isn't a whole lot of difference there in ballistics the ballistics data is not that much different the 10 millimeter uh barely edges out the 357 magnum which i think i compensate for with the bullet selection and um, personally i would trade a 357 chamber with an effective bullet over a 10 millimeter loaded with whatever i found at walmart so for me, it's functionality and bullet selection are the two things that I choose when I'm when I when I pick up my K6. Let's talk about the functionality first. I spent 30 years of my life in law enforcement. Before that, I was in the Marine Corps, training with different handgun platforms. Uh, I started out with a revolver when I got hired as in law enforcement. That's how long ago it was. We were still carrying wheel guns. And then we transitioned over to the Sig Sauer P220, which is a semi-automatic handgun. Well, the 10 millimeter is a semi-automatic handgun too. And one of the things that I think that um, I'm just going to address it. The elephant in the room here is a semi-automatic handgun is more prone to problems and malfunctions than a revolver. So when you even when you carry one every day, it takes, I don't know how many rounds I've fired through semi-automatic, but I just want you to ask yourself this question. How many times have you gone through immediate action drills with a semi-automatic handgun? Cleared stovepipe, double feeds, mag changes, uh, combat mag changes, all of that sort of stuff. That is all muscle memory stuff. And the reason I bring that up is because when you get into a stressful situation, then you go back to that lizard brain reaction, that very, your motor skills go out the door. Unless you have committed immediate action drills and emergency function checks on firearms, then you're not going to remember how to do that unless you've got tons of repetition. And you might think, well, you know, you just said you, you've trained for 30 years with that stuff. Yeah, but they're perishable skills. And it's been four years since I retired and carried a semi-automatic handgun with me every day doing function checks and, and immediate action drills and all that sort of stuff where I did that stuff every day as part of my daily routine. Just four years. So, at this point, I feel much more confident in the functionality of a revolver, 
a double action revolver. You never hear about them jamming. They're highly functional and they're just dependable. So that's why I choose the revolver. I would rather have six shots that are good shots in a firearm that works than carry 15 shots in a semi-automatic if I don't know how to use the platform. And let's all admit it, none of us are John Wick. As much as we would like to be or as much as we think, sit around and think that we are, you know, we're not. So I guess my reasoning, my personal reasoning for choosing the 357 Magnum is because it comes in a revolver. There's six shots. If I can squeeze the trigger, I've got a much higher probability of that firearm functioning. Now, let's talk. I did mention bullet selection. So you can buy these bullets for the 10 millimeter or the 357 mag. So if, if you're trained up and you're going to be the next John Wick in the next movie, then, then you can rest assured that there's a bullet out there for you. Like I said, I'm more into bullet design and bullet performance than I worry about caliber. I'd much rather have um, a 9 millimeter loaded with the right bullet than my 357 loaded with semi-jacketed hollow points that were designed for law enforcement use and self-defense purposes inside your home. I personally use the Underwood ammo, the Extreme Hunter ammunition. That ammunition is loaded with the Lay High Defense solid copper bullet. It's called a monolithic bullet. The reason I went with that bullet is because of a few things. For one thing, I was very skeptical of the copper bullet thing. I, you know, I put on my tinfoil hat and thought, well, these companies are just trying to push us to copper to get us away from lead with the lead shot attacks on wildlife refuges and all that stuff until I look, actually looked at the science behind it and saw the performance for myself. So we've had a couple different podcasts about bullet performances or bullet performance. And one of them was with Seth from um, Hornady, and he did a really good job of explaining why copper solid bullets are so good for our application in hunting. And the way to explain it is we are looking for energy retention and terminal performance on our bullets that we're selecting. What copper does for us is it retains its weight so instead of that energy lasting for six inches of penetration inside the body cavity of the the animal we're hunting now with the weight retention that copper bullet is traveling much farther and delivering much more terminal penetration and energy inside where we want it inside the smokehouse where it needs to go it's not running out of steam six inches after it penetrates hair and hide and bone and all that stuff. The copper solid bullet is going to keep on moving until it just runs out of energy two, three times that terminal penetration that you're going to get from a jacketed hollow point or something similar. And I wish I had the bullet. I shot a bear with the Underwood ammo out of my 357 last year in New Mexico, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, the inside chest cavity of this bear was pure jelly. I mean, it was amazing. And when I recovered the bullet out of the bear, I had it and I looked for it so I could post a picture of it with this podcast. It, it expanded properly. It maintained, you could, have, you could have taken all the pedals and pushed them back up and reformed the bullet. It didn't lose anything. So that's why I chose that particular round for to carry in a 357. So that does it. That that's going to do it. Bullet performance and functionality of the 357. And like I said, you can get the lay high defense bullet loaded in a 10 millimeter or whatever. I've got them for my 44. One last plug for the 357 and then we'll shut this one down, folks, is the 357 is just tried and true, and it's a versatile handgun. I can buy 38 Special 
and still train with my handgun train you should be training to draw and fire whatever whatever handgun you choose to carry going through function drills all that stuff and i can do that more economically by shooting 38 special out of the 357 there isn't a substitute for the 10 millimeter 10 millimeter ammo is comparatively expensive uh it's in 38 cheap so I can get a lot more rounds on target and a lot more time shooting and training with the 357 revolver and also have the dependable functionality of that, that shooting platform, whereas it's going to get in my pocket a little bit more when, when I really need to be training with that 10 millimeter. That is is going to wrap it up for this episode of Houndsman XP. Make sure you're checking us out on social media. Make sure you're supporting our fight for houndsman's rights in Colorado. We're, we're, we're in a full-scale brawl in Colorado with the anti-hunting crowd. And when you purchase one of our hoodies or our T-shirts from our Join or Die collection in our shop, then... The profits from the sale of that sweatshirt are going directly to Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management, CRWM. They are leading the charge on this thing. It's imperative. I don't care if you go straight to SaveTheHuntColorado.com. SaveTheHuntColorado.com. Bypass us. Make your donation there. If you don't, want, if you don't like the design or, or, you know, whatever. Just get the money there. We got to have it to win this thing. And it's so important that we win in Colorado on this issue. If we don't win there, I promise you, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, New Mexico, Arizona, you guys that are out there lion hunting today while I'm stuck here in Indiana recording this podcast, you guys are out there getting after it. They're coming for you next. If we can set them back there, Beat them there and not just win, but beat them. We'll make them think twice before they come to your state and try this same kind of garbage. Thanks for tuning in. That's going to do it for this episode. This is Fair Chase.